I'm excited to announce my new project that is being released. It is called Classic WoW Builds. In this video, I'm going to do a quick introduction to explain what it is, and then I'm going to go over the tech stack that I use to build this guy. So to start off, this is a website that is a companion to a game called Classic World of Warcraft, which is coming out August 27th. So what this is, is a website where you can create builds for that, and you can search for items, and you can basically plan for uh, the release of the game and when the release, and when the game is out, you can actually use it to plan your guide. Um, so what it looks like is this homepage, we have some cards. These are actual builds. And then we have some things so you can sort the builds. Um, and we don't have a ton of builds yet since it's brand new. Um, but you can see you can sort by class. You can sort by spec. If you're familiar with the game, you can sort by different attributes and see different cards. Then if I click on a build, we can actually see what a build looks like. And the part that we did here is we made tabs. So you can have basically tabs for your build and you can put all kind of information inside of it. So here we can see the talent spec um, for this rogue. And then we can go through and we can read the explanations for each items. You also notice we have tooltips from WoW. So you can see the tooltips for the items. So when you hover over stuff, you can do that. We also made a uh, improvement on the, this particular talent build. If I open up, if I go to create build here, um, and I, I can add as many tabs as I want. So I can go to talent tree, add new tab. If I control click, you can easily go through and uh, fill out your talent tree quickly. Um, and then we have rotations. So here you can kind of create um, what your World of Warcraft rotations are going to be. Um, we can see this is kind of some icons. We can hover and get tooltips. And we can basically see what the rotation for your different classes are going to be. Um, basically, it's just a list of those. You can also use this to create tier lists and whatnot. So for example, here's a tier list of the best BOE daggers. And the ranked. And so basically, the site allows you to build this out. You can also uh, pick gear. And hover over, you can get tool tips for the gear. And again, you can create as many tabs as you want so you can create gear at different levels and show off what your build is going to be. So this is what it looks like to uh, what a finished build may look like. And you can create builds using this form over here. Um, and you can name your, your tabs. You can drag and drop um, to sort that tabs. And then you can pick which kind of tab you want to create. So we have three types of tabs. You can create an item tab, item slot tab. So this is kind of like um, we have templates. So this is template one. And I have kind of a quick add search that you can do here. So you can search for items and they just pop up and then they go into the correct slot. Or you can search for a single slot. So for example, here I'm searching for gloves. And it shows up there. Then also, you can see you can add explanations. This is the best helm. And we also had an at sign where I can ping other items. So I don't know, maybe I want to include the dash item or a skill here. I can do that. Um, and then uh, we also have the ability to add other explanations as well. So this is another autocomplete search down here. And that's so you can create your builds. The other uh, thing to this is that's, that's that's the main portion is creating builds and being able to view and find builds But there's another thing we add to be able to find the items you want for a particular build So this is basically a large search where you can put in your class spec some different information what phase of classic you want um, And then the level so we can go to level 60 and I can see like the best daggers at level 60 and I can see, and basically what we did is we created some stat weights where you can see what the top weapons are um, or the type things for each class are. And I can now be like, oh, this item looks cool. I should add this to my build. So we use this as a best in slot search where you can find the best items for each slot at different levels. So I can go to level 30, see what daggers are good at that level. Um, and I want a level for that, for example. Um, and we can see what that looks like here. So yeah, that is the website, 
if you, I don't know how many of you actually play World of Warcraft or are going to play it in Classic WoW, but if you are, do give this site a try and let me know how you like it. It's definitely a work in progress and there's a lot of stuff I still want to add, um, but that's that. So let's talk about how I actually built this guy right here. So right now you can see it is at www.classicwowbuilds.com. So this guy is live in production and he is being hosted right now on DigitalOcean. And I have everything hosted there. So I have my back end hosted there and I also have my front end hosted there and it's all in a single droplet right now. Now, if you follow me, you may be a little confused by that because I've always talked about how much I like Netlify and I recommend deploying there. Uh, but one of the first things that I decided for this project is I wanted to do server-side rendering. And the reason why is because we have a whole bunch of builds over here. And I wanted each one of these to be indexed by Google. Um, and I wanted these to be indexed quickly as people make changes and whatnot. So I wanted good SEO. So because of that, and uh, I went with server-side rendering and I went with Next.js as my choice for the front end. Um, I enjoyed using Next.js. You can see uh, as I click here, the page is kind of a server-side render. Well, not, not when I'm already load the page, but you can see I have this little progress bar at the top there. I added that so you can see as the page is loading, kind of matches GitHub's. Um, that's, that's using something called in progress if you're interested in adding that to your own site. And the other thing is I'll, how I'm you know serving Next.js in my backend in DigitalOcean. I'm using Doku for that. Um, this is something that I'm also using for Saffron. I like it a lot. Uh, I use it for basically managing my applications. It's kind of like Heroku, but you can stick it in DigitalOcean. I like this because I can have everything in one place. And so I have my server and my uh, Next.js application being served by Docu. And I also have a Postgres server that Docu handles and orchestrates that stuff. Um, so yeah, so we have Next.js going on here. And if, this is built with React. And so I wanted server-side rendering, so I chose that. The other part about the front end is it's using GraphQL. So we're using Apollo here. and uh, Last, I think the last part of the front end is what I use for styling. So I ended up choosing a motion for styling over styled components. So I wrote my own CSS for this. And reason I did that is I wanted to, uh, well, one, I liked writing my own CSS better because I can customize it. And then two, I chose a motion because it was a very easy to set up at the time. Um, it required no extra setup, whereas style components, you had to add some stuff. Um, and the, I believe, underscore and score app for Next.js. And I used um, style components for a previous project in Next.js, and I felt like it it kind of didn't work as well as I would have liked. I felt like Motion had, had a much smoother experience. I had less weird bugs come up than I did with style components. So I'm happy I chose that. Um, and I think that's it for the, the front end. I wrote this down just to make sure I cover everything. The last thing I want to talk about was I chose to use Cloudflare for some stuff. So you can see we have a lot of images showing up on this page. So you can see I have a lot of images here um, and pretty much every tab oh, there's a ton of images, right? And look how many images are showing up here. So the images I actually have stored on Google Cloud Storage. I tried using Nginx to serve the static files for a while. One thing to note about these little icons is they're static. So that was a nice plus so I didn't have to worry about dynamic images. So they were all sized beforehand. And uh, I, was, I started with serving them with Nginx, um, but it was, I turned out to be way too slow and too much of a, uh, my server was getting overloaded trying to load this many images for the page. Um, so I need to upgrade my, my server more or I could just move it to Google Cloud Storage and I did and now images load pretty nice. And then in front of that, I have Cloudflare caching stuff. So if I inspect this, I can go to network tab and I can see images here. If we click on some of these guys, we can go to the header. We can see the cache status. This this particular image was a hit. See some other items. Um, this one was a hit as well. So you can see some of this stuff is getting cached by Cloudflare. Um, that way it is, um, does it takes the load off my server. 
The other thing is these tooltips are basically just JSON loaded. So if we go to network tab here, you can see this. So you can see as I hover each one, you can see the network requests. So I'm at seven requests, hover eight, nine, 10. So every hover is a request to get the uh, JSON for this. So that's another thing that I have stored on Google Cloud Storage. I have the JSON data for this. Um, because again, this is just static. So I could compute it beforehand, and then I have Cloudflare sitting in front of it, caching that JSON data, because I want to take as much load off of my server, because um, there's already so much um, computations that are happening here. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's going on with Cloudflare. The other thing I'm caching with Cloudflare is this search right here, the BIS search. There's a lot of different combinations you can do, so each one is being individually cached. So a choice that I used for that was, um, this is actually still a GraphQL request, um, but the GraphQL request is a Git query. So you can see this gnarly Git query that it gets generated here, and then Cloudflare caches this Git query, um, and gra this GraphQL Git query um, based on the query parameters. So when the query parameters change, it's gonna cache it differently. So if I do 60 or 34, so and create a new query, and this query here has new parameters in there, so it's going to be cached differently. And then there's one other spot that I'm using Cloudflare to cache stuff for. That's for uh, searching. So this little autocomplete here, this can easily generate a lot of requests. So this, this I'm um, doing the same thing. It's a GraphQL request that I made a Git query instead of a post request. That way it can be cached in Cloudflare. Um, and so also that's pretty easy to do with Apollo, by the way, you can just set an option in Apollo for that. Um, but this this is one thing of the autocomplete I, I don't think I have perfect yet. I started with debouncing and throttling the input if you're familiar with that, basically just to limit the number of requests that were made. But I found like it, it made a really janky experience when I was doing this. And one thing I noticed when I was using Google is every keystroke they make a request to the server it looked like so i went ahead and just copied that technique and it seemed to have a lot smoother of an experience when typing and seeing the results but it's making a lot of requests so i made sure i have cloudflare sitting in front caching some of these requests um, i'm not sure how good of a job it's doing i really need to double check that um, but that's that's one thing i chose for that um, all right so let's talk about lastly the back end portion of this guy. So if you're familiar with any of my content, this is probably go to no surprise at all. Um, this is the stack that I'm using. We're using GraphQL, PostgreSQL as the database, Node.js, whole project I'm using TypeScript by the way. Um, TypeScript has been great through the whole thing, highly recommend. Uh, I like it for solo projects and also for team projects, it's been great. Um, this is, um, uh, also using Typeform and Type GraphQL. So these two may be a little bit, the Type GraphQL may be a surprise. I recently picked that up. Um, I really liked Type GraphQL for this project in Typeform. I just don't spend that much time building the backend for this sort of thing. I, I, I have a stronger backend skills, I suppose. So uh, I would say like 90% of the project was actually spent building out the Emotion Apollo React JS stuff. Like the front end takes way more work for me when building this. And so type GraphQL and type form, I wrote very little code for, um, and it's functioning well for the site. I like using that as my, my backend. It gives me a lot of flexibility and type form plus type GraphQL. I don't have to duplicate my types as much. So I like that a lot. So type GraphQL was very nice in conjunction with type form. Um, so I was happy with this data tier. The other thing that I want to talk about was uh, I had some stuff for PostgreSQL um, to make up. First off, to make this search really fast. So this is a Postgres search. I'm thinking I may at some point switch this over to a search engine. Um, but right now it's using uh, Postgres. I'm using a trigram search. So what that means is, or am I using trigram? I think I added a trigram index. Uh, basically, it makes it fast. Um, I I didn't, I think I removed, I was using the trigram search as well, but I think I removed it at some point because it wasn't working as well. At least what I wanted was, I want the ability is, I want the ability to see where it says band 
and then I can see a band shows up here or it shows up anywhere. So you can do that with just an I like statement in Postgres if you're familiar. And so uh, I ended up just using an I like statement for this search, but it's using a trigram index, I believe. Um, I think. I don't know if you can do a trigram index with I like. I think you can. I think that's what I have. Um, but that was one option I chose for the search. And then the other thing is I'm using triggers. So this is kind of an interesting thing that I did. So this was, I wanted to be able to get totals. So the total number of likes that this build has. And I also want to see the total number of likes a single person has. So let's go over here. So that was, that was my build. So let's see Lanisar. So Lanisar has one build with a total of two likes. And let's see if Roger has more. So he has four four likes across a couple different builds. Um, looks like I have one point difference. Uh, but anyway, to compute those values, you might normally, if you're familiar with SQL, do like a count statement. You know, like select count and count the number of rows. But this is quite a slow statement, especially as your data grows. And so I didn't want to do that for my home page load for every single build and then also do it for the number of the users has. So what I did is anytime a user likes a build, like I can come over here to this build and I can give it a heart. And whenever I give it a heart, a Postgres trigger fires off. And this trigger um, basically increments an integer value that I have on this build and increases it to three. So basically I have a trigger whenever the like button happens, it's going to increment how many this build has and it's also gonna increment the number that user has. Um, so here we can see we have three hearts for this guy. So when I click that heart, it triggered a trigger for this to increase the hearts. So instead of, and so basically you can think I'm caching the value, the value, these two values. Um, and, and I'm basically every time I get a delete or a create of a like, it triggers and it increments these two cached values. So that's something I did so I would avoid the number of queries that I was doing to com compute some of those values and then do a count on each one. Um, I think that's about it. Yep, that's pretty much the stack that I used to uh, create this. I was very happy with this. This is a similar stack that I used for Saffron and uh, I'm happy with it. I feel very productive with it. Um, the back end I'm very happy with. I feel like I am able to create stuff very quickly with now. Um, the front end I'm happy with, but I, I am much slower, but it takes just more time to build out the layouts and the styling and some of the logic. And this particular project too had very complex logic around um, creating the builds. So this particular tab page was very complex to get all this working. Um, I forgot to show you guys, we also have backup slots. That's a whole nother thing. Um, there's this a very complex in this form. And then this was very complex as well, the talent tree. And I don't think I showed you guys the rotation. That's how you create a rotation. So this is a little bit complex as well. So here I'm gonna I'm gonna do wrath wrath move fire. Alright, so we can see we have these auras so you can do that. And we also made it so you can like you can drag and drop these into different places. And you can preview it when you're done. And so all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot more logic, I guess, on this one on the front end. So I felt like I was spending a lot of time. But overall, I I'd be very happy doing another project with this exact same stack. And uh, there you go.